So I was going to do something else. <laughs> and then I woke up and I had this on my mind so much that I just stopped the one I was doing and spent all day working on this one. So, um, and in the process of studying pride, I learned a lot of things that I don't think people realize is qualifies as pride, that it's a lot more, it's a lot more complex in practicality than we think or that we've been taught. Um, from the beginning, however, pride was Satan's undoing. That's where it started, was with Satan. He chose to allow his pride-filled ego, which is what he allowed to develop to be his compass. He put self in the place of God, so he governed his choices by self. That's the religion that he invented was self, self, leaning on self. But it was also from then on, this has been the main downfall of many men and women and many who believe that they are secure in Christ are not. According to what the Bible says about pride, many are likely not going to heaven and pride is the reason why. So it's something people need to understand because the Bible is very clear about what pride is and the consequence of keeping it. Pride is both an attitude and a type of behavior. And in the Bible, God clearly tells us that we must die to self to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And he warns us about all the dangers of not dying to self and continuing to live for self. And he knew, obviously, that humanity was going to be self-obsessed. He made great provision for us to be redeemed. Satan was destroyed because of pride, and he wants as many humans to suffer the same end out of his rage. Self-serving, self-centered pride, which is an I will do it by myself attitude, eventually becomes self-absorption. And this prideful heart is what causes us to commit the sin of vanity. And that sin cuts God out of our lives because we try to do it on our own. And then we think of ourselves as successful. And a lot of people are doing this in faith. They think that they can quit doing this or quit doing that. They say, I just have to stop doing this. That is actually pride. Isaiah 5, 18 and 21 says, Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Without God's guidance and protection, Satan can control our thoughts through the sin of pride. And no matter how smart we think we are, we are absolutely no match for the devil's deceptive influence. Many think or boast on um, winning over the enemy, but there's nothing to brag about in taking on the devil because he is a, a wicked foe and he's a lot smarter than humans. Pride in the Bible refers to a sinful, arrogant, haughty, self-reliant attitude or a spirit that causes a person to have a puffed up view of themselves in general terms. And those who are proud think of themselves as better than others and they look down on others with contempt and judgment. And this is something the church needs to be aware of because this is a common thing that people who are in deep addiction and sin report not feeling welcomed into the church community. And I was once there myself because of the contempt that was shown for me. So it's something that um, there's pride at many levels. The proud do not have a correct or honest estimate, estimation of themselves and their abilities or the significance in roles. They think of themselves more highly than they ought, and they see themselves as over and above others and believe themselves to be more important than other people. There's another side to this, so that's coming. Genesis 3, 5 says, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And the devil's greatest lie that we could possess the ability to rightfully judge good and evil for ourselves and for each other. Pride hijacks our focus from loving our neighbor to competing and comparing with others. So the comparing is pride. When we let pride take over, we forget that God created us equally and that he gifts 
purposes, views, and treats us justly. When prideful, we start to take credit for our own accomplishments. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 states, For those for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? The clearest example of pride in the Bible is Satan himself. A former angel, he was not content with his status or station, and instead of submitting to the rule of God, he opposed God and now opposes God's people. And the Bible refers to Satan as the adversary in multiple places. Not content with his own rebellion, Satan went on to tempt all of us as well. Pride was the main temptation that Satan uses to get man on his side, which is going to hell in the end. The temptation to be like God was not to be in the image of God, for man and woman were already made in the image of God. Satan's temptation was for man to become independent of God, self-reliant, and instead of relying on and trusting in God and his word, Adam and Eve gave in to Satan's lies, sinned against God, and instead of acknowledging God's authority through grateful worship, they all sought to exalt themselves to a status of equality with God himself so that they could make themselves the one who assesses the choices in their lives. The result of pride is contention, shame, death, and destruction. And even though God has allowed Satan to roam the world for now, his end is very certain and God is clear about what it will be. The same result of man's pride is enmity between man and God, shame, guilt, and death. These examples prove the truth of Proverbs 16, 18, which says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The consequences of that fall are recorded in the first chapter of Romans, verses 18 to 32. Mankind has brought a curse on both the world and themselves through both Adam's fall and our own prideful disobedience. Pride is actually very similar to atheism in that we are glorifying ourselves rather than God. And if we believe we are above the need for God's help, we are then using our free will to walk away from him. And by deciding to do it our way, we will get stuck in our prideful state and we will soon be deaf to the voice of God. And this is why it's called the deadly sin. The only sin that keeps us from heaven is saying no to Jesus and shutting him out. Mark 3, 28 and 29 says, Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and what, whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Without the Holy Spirit, we have no one to lead us, no one to rescue us or comfort us, and most, most importantly, no one to forgive us. Then there's no hope for eternity in heaven. And there appears to be only one verse in the Bible which is translated in such a way to say that pride is good, and that is in Second Chronicles 17.6. He took great pride in the ways of the Lord and again removed the high places and the ashram from Judah. The Hebrew meaning says his heart was exalted, and this means that he was excited about the ways of the Lord, and that is not our usual meaning of the word pride, but that's the only place where it talks about pride in a good sense. Some people talk about the need for people to have a positive self-image, but actually there is no such thing as a positive self-image apart from God. Our worth and our value is found in the fact that God loves us and died for us. And God tells us that he values us very much and that we should never exist outside of him. Pride is a sin, and there are many verses that say this. Here are just a few. Proverbs 11, 2 says, When pride comes, then comes dishonor, with, but, with humble, with, uh, but with the humble is wisdom. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. Verse John 2, 16 says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And probably the strongest verse in the Bible is found in James 4, 6 through 9. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. 
Pride is also the cause often for other sins. The first sin to be committed on the earth was due to pride with Adam and Eve. They chose to depart from what God had said to their own thoughts of what they were missing. It is also what caused the first murder committed on the earth. It makes us oblivious to danger. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall. And we must be able to recognize and see the stumbling blocks that Satan places before us or we will trip and fall into them. We simply don't see the danger because we don't believe we will get caught this time. And then the next time, and then the next time, and then the next time. Pretty soon you're hard-hearted. You don't hear God. You don't even have a conscience about that because your heart is so hard. Pride makes us blind to our own condition and our condition before God. The Pharisees are a prime example of those in the Bible who were infected with pride and spiritual blindness. The Pharisees could not see their own spiritual condition because of pride, which resulted in self-righteousness. They murdered Jesus. That's where that ended up. And they felt entitled to murder Jesus. This deception also shows the danger of comparing ourselves to others. We should strive to be acceptable to God and not just better than other people. Christians must understand that we are saved by God's grace and the only thing that separates us from the world is the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing about ourselves, not our own righteousness, nothing about our self-worth. Pride makes us foolish. It makes us independent and that causes us to not seek counsel from others, to trust in our own understanding, and in the end it will condemn us to hell. And I have been as guilty as a lot of other people I know of not seeking counsel because I knew the answer I wanted. I knew what I wanted. I knew I was going to go for that. And I did not want anyone to tell me the obvious, which was don't do it. So that is pride that goes to destruction. We must abstain from having pride and refrain from displaying it at all cost. We are never told to love ourselves more in the Bible. Many think that's in there somewhere, but it is not in the Bible. We are not told to love ourselves more. There are six forms of pride taught about in the Bible. Because pride seems expected when we succeed, the first three are easy to see. But most people don't realize that there's pride in failure. So the second set are harder to see. The first one is self-exaltation. Pride gives credit to self. When a person succeeds and gives himself credit, he's being prideful. Our human tendency is to credit ourselves when we succeed and Jesus warns that God will humble those that exalt themselves. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted, Matthew 23, 12. Everything that is good comes from God. We contribute nothing. God accomplished everything, including anything that pertains to our salvation. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2, 8 through, through, 8 through 9. Never exalt yourself. There is no provision for that anywhere. Number two is self-promotion. Pride welcomes praise from others. So instead of exalting self, some let others exalt them. So accepting credit from others is another form of pride. When we put forth our success so that others will compliment us, we are being prideful. Jesus scolded those who paraded their righteous behavior to promote getting attention. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other men in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Matthew 6, 1 through 2. Never promote yourself. 3. Self-justification. Pride expects credit from God himself. We should resist seeking applause from other people. Likewise, we should avoid seeking God's admiration. Expecting credit from God is another form of pride. There is nothing honorable or virtuous within us, nothing. We are utterly sinful and God's wrath abides on us, every single one of us. The, the substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross is the only reason that we avoid God's anger, punishment, and judgment. He bore our guilt and he credits us 
his righteousness when we place our trust in him. So consequently, our fellowship with God is restored because of what Jesus did, his assigned righteousness, and God promised us rewards in heaven, but our right standing and our ability to obey is solely based on the work of Jesus. The thought that we can earn God's approval by our actions is a very deadly form of pride. And many people think, I'm not addicted like I was last year, or I'm not doing the behavior that I was a month ago. It's never based on that. It is never based on that. And thinking that way is very deadly because it's based on self. God does not seek or use a person who thinks like this. He's looking for one who recognizes that he has nothing to offer. He comes to God as a beggar pleading for grace. He feels he deserves nothing from God. That's the one God can use. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 3. We have peace with God because he freely gave us that position through Christ. Never justify yourself. So if someone thinks they have something to offer God based on their own behavior, good or bad or better than before, God will bench you. If you're being used in ministry, I would question you to check the fruit because God is not in that. Number four, self-degradation. Pride tears himself down. The next three forms of pride are more subtle because they're hidden in failure. Many don't expect to find pride in their hearts when they're actually failing. And in fact, people often view failure, failure as ground for humility. When you tear yourself down, you are being prideful. You are prideful because you're self-absorbed. You are focusing on yourself and you are preoccupied with self. The great secret to humility is not to focus on yourself at all, but to fill your mind and your heart with the things of God. Pride is simply self-preoccupation. A prideful person thinks about himself, good or bad. He's rarely concerned about the impact of his attention seeking on others, and he forgets the impact it's having on Christ. He's shaming the gospel. A prideful person is concerned only with self at the end of the day, and what is shocking is that a suicidal person is prideful. He has other sins that are interwoven with pride, but the root of that behavior is pride. He's prideful because his world revolves around himself, and if he was concerned about his loved ones, if he was concerned about the impact on the kingdom, he would not think about suicide. If he were fixated on God, he would not contemplate suicide because he would know the worth of his life. A suicidal person is preoccupied with self, and when his expectations are not met, he destroys himself. He has no outside person or entity governing himself. It is all what he thinks, which is the essence of pride. Five, self-demotion. Pride compares himself to others. A prideful person can degrade themselves privately or publicly. Self-demotion is announcing that you have performed worse than others. You conv convince others that you are less or you have less. You argue that compared to others, you are inferior or you have been cheated. You create a self-pity party for yourself to anyone who will listen to you. You decide you have a worst past, greater wounds as a child, you had the worst parents, your circumstances were the worst, and you use this to excuse your current behavior and your current attention-seeking behavior. And this offends God, and it will keep you far from anything that's sacred or valuable to him. He cannot use you. He cannot place you near anything that's important to himself because you are judging him and you're declaring him as the reason that you technically prostitute yourself for attention from others rather than confessing your wickedness and receiving healing that he died to give you. Others easily see this conduct as offensive to God and very immature and ministries avoid this type of person. They know that this is a scandal that is waiting to happen and that person is very willing to rush into a scandal. They have nothing but a insatiable time of trying to tax the entire ministry for more. They are time wasters. They waste so many people's time because they want so much attention. And many are very quick to wipe their hands of this kind because of just how much they absorb of your time. They just waste time. Here's a quote from a commentary. It says, 
The reason self-pity does not look like pride is that it appears to be needy. But the need arises from a wounded ego and the desire of the self-pitying is not really for others to see them as helpless, but as heroes. The need self-pity feels does not come from a sense of unworthiness, but from a sense of unrecognized worthiness. It is the response of unapplauded pride. Self-demotion is a form of self-promotion. You're fishing for affirmation. You want others to reaffirm, no, you're not a failure. You're really amazing. You're an awesome person. So when people sit and say these degrading things about themselves to people, they're hoping that people respond back with all kinds of affirmation. Placing yourself as inferior to others is pride and judgment against God. Do not seek attention and affirmation from others by making yourself look inferior. This is oppositional to God, and it cuts you off from any kind of blessing he would have for you. Six, self-condemnation. Pride judges himself. The sixth form of pride is private, a private manifestation itself in times of personal failure. It does not seek the affirmation, approval, and admiration of others. Instead, this form of pride occurs when a person condemns himself because he does not meet his own standard. It can be misdiagnosed as depression, and we think a person who hopelessly condemns himself is depressed, so we attempt to cheer them up. When we're unsuccessful in changing their mindset, we conclude that their depression runs very deep. But the man who condemns himself is not primarily dealing with depression. His problem is pride. The self-condemned person places his views, his standard, and his own assessment above that of everyone else. He resists God's grace because he denies God is the true source of salvation, blessing, and truth. He refuses the help of others, and compared to his companions and God, he thinks he knows better than both. The self-condemned person makes himself the judge. He takes the authority away from God and gives it to himself. The truly humble man gives up all desire to pass judgment on himself, on others. He gives up all desire to pass judgment. He understands that he stands condemned in God's presence, that God has the authority and power to condemn us. So instead of judgment, the humble man asks for mercy. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Titus 3, 3 through 6. Many well-meaning Christians mislabel insecurity as humility, but there is a significance between the two. A humble person does not spend any amount of time thinking about his or her own flaws. The Webster's Dictionary defines something called navel-gazing as useless or excessive self-contemplation. No one's immune to this distorted self-love because that's exactly what it is. It's self-love, but it's very distorted. You open easy doors to the work of the devil in your life and sadly to the community around you. A periodic self-assessment can help, but we need to stop self-analyzing. There's only so far we can go before our thoughts become repetitive and boring. So the remedy for low self-esteem comes with a change of focus to God from yourself. Stop looking at yourself. Look to Jesus. According to Jesus, the most important thing we can do is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. If our insecurities get in the way of our ability to love the people that God has placed in our lives, we have a big problem. Because if we're not loving the people around us more than ourselves, we've not only missed we're certainly not loving God either because the fruit of that would be the people around us are being loved by us. We're certainly not causing them problems or imposing our own will, our own desires. They should feel completely served by us. Reading the Bible challenges us to rearrange our heart's desires and instead of spending the majority of our time contemplating our flaws and worrying about what people think of us, we need to love God and our neighbor. The first step to recovery from low self-esteem is definitely not to love yourself more. The first step is to love God more. 
and then love your neighbor as yourself. We need to understand how the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms our identity and our self-worth. Attention seeking is a refusal to do that, and it aligns with the way of Satan. If you are a Christian, God is for you. If you doubt that, you're ignoring the Bible. He gave his son for you. He justifies you. Jesus died for you. He rose again. He intercedes for you. You can accept that or you can ignore that and deny him in action. That's choosing the way of the devil. Our response to self-criticism must not be love yourself more. We must learn to look past ourselves. God and the people in our lives should consume a great amount of our time and attention. We are called to serve. In his essay on undetected pride, Jonathan Edwards points out seven sneaky symptoms of the infection of pride. One, fault finding. When pride causes us to filter out the evil we see in ourselves, it also causes us to filter out God's goodness in other people. We sift them, letting only their faults fall into our perception of them. When I'm sitting in a sermon or studying a passage, it's pride that prompts the terrible temptation to skip the spirit surgery on my own heart and instead draft a mental plan of a potential conversation for the people who really need to hear this. Edwards writes, a spiritually proud person shows, shows in his fault finding with other, other saints, he chooses they need to hear this. The humble Christian has so much to do at home and sees so much evil in his own heart that he is not apt to be very busy with the hearts of others. To a harsh spirit, those who have the sickness of pride in their heart speak of others' sins with contempt, irritation, frustration, or judgment. Pride is crouching inside our belittling of the struggles of other people. It's cowering in our jokes about the craziness of our spouse. It may be even lurking in the prayers we throw upwards for our friends that are not tainted with exasperated irritation, subtly or not. And again, Edwards writes, Christians who are but fellow worms ought to at least treat one another with such humility and gentleness as Christ treats them. Three, superficiality. When pride lives in our hearts, we're far more concerned with others' perceptions of us than the reality of our own hearts. We fight the sins that have an impact on how others view us and make peace with the ones that no one sees. We have great success in the areas of holiness that have highly visible accountability, but little concern for the disciplines that happen in secret. Four, defensiveness. Those who stand in the strength of Christ's righteousness alone find a confident hiding place from the attacks of men and Satan alike. True humility is not knocked off its balance and thrown into a defensive posture by a challenge or a rebuke, but instead it continues in doing good and trusting the soul to our faithful creator. Edward says, for the humble Christian, the more the world is against him, the more silent and still he will be, unless it is in his prayer closet, and there he will not be still. Five, presumption before God. Humility approaches God with a humble assurance in Christ Jesus. If either the humble or the assurance are missing in that equation, our hearts are very well infected with pride. Some of us have no shortage of boldness before God, but if we're not careful, we can forget that he is God. Others of us feel no confidence before God, which sounds like humility, but in reality, it's a symptom of pride. In those moments, we're testifying that we believe our sins are greater than his grace. We doubt the power of Christ's blood, and we're stuck staring at ourselves instead of Jesus Christ. Six, desperation for attention. Pride is hungry for attention, respect, and worship in all forms. And it sounds like shameless boasting about ourselves. Maybe it's being unable to say no to anyone because we need to be needed. Maybe it looks like obsessively thirsting for marriage or a better marriage or a date or something because you're so hungry to be adored. Maybe it looks like being haunted by your desire for the right house, the right job, the right salary, all because you seek glory that comes from man and not God. Seven, neglecting others. Pride prefers some people over others. It honors those who the world deems worthy of honor. 
giving more weight to their words, their wants, and their needs. And there's a thrill that goes through when people acknowledge you, that you perceive have that. We consciously or unconsciously pass over the weak, the inconvenient, the unattractive, because they don't have much to offer us. There's good news for the prideful. Confession of pride singles, signals the beginning of the end for pride. It indicates that war is being waged. Psalm 139, 23-24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be a grievous way in me, and lead me to the way everlasting. Today, many Christians admire King Solomon. If he were here, they would place him in church leadership. Why? Because they will point out to the amazing temple he built for God. Many would say he was a man of God. All that one needed was to look at how God had blessed him with wealth and fame. And now, what they don't look at is how his heart was towards God. Many would forgive him for his womanizing, his false doctrine, and they would let him continue to minister because he looked so blessed by God. But God was not pleased with him, and he planned to end his ministry. God sets a high standard for leaders. He did the same thing to Moses after Moses disobeyed by striking the rock three times when he should have spoken to the rock. God asked him in Numbers 20 to speak to the rock, and he struck it instead. God ended his ministry and did not let him enter the promised land as a result of that. We must be careful to avoid a wrong concept of Christ's love and look at what we think are blessings and overlook the obvious sin because God does not. So if you are in a position where you're influencing other people and you think, I can steer out into this one area, and you think people don't see it, but they do because they can feel the, the compromise in you. The impact on the kingdom is you're working for the enemy. You're actually working for the enemy. You have to ask yourself these questions. Do I exalt myself? Do I promote myself? Do I justify myself? Do I degrade myself? Do I demote myself? And do I condemn myself? If you answer yes to any of these questions, you have sinful pride, and pride will kill you forever. And no matter how far we drift from God, he's still there waiting for us. If you're still alive, you still have an opportunity to repent. He never leaves us or abandons us, no matter how far we stray from him. If we would simply go to him and talk to him about everything, he would gladly guide, lead, and direct us. If we would get out of our self-thinking, and into leaning on and trusting in the Lord, God would give us a divine power that would fill our lives. The blessings would chase us down and run us over. People would know, like they did in the New, the New Testament, that they had been with Jesus. They can feel it on them. They can see it on them. So anyone who doesn't have that, it's because they're choosing to harbor a self-driven something. All we need to do is stop trying to force our will and follow Jesus. Here's a biblical formula to success according to the word of God. Ask God to lead you into his plan and then listen to his guidance. Think before doing anything. Get godly advice, then move and take a step in the direction God is leading you and always do the right thing. I've done enough of this in my life to know that when I want a certain thing, I will avoid asking people for guidance because I want a certain outcome. And I know that it's wrong. And I know that people are going to say, don't do it. But I don't want to hear that. So I push ahead. I tend to not do that anymore because the consequences are great to me. But the problem is the consequences are much greater to those who are watching me. And when you get yourself in a position where you are being watched by others, you're shaming the cross of Christ by acting that way. And that to me is the most heartbreaking thing I could possibly do. After all that Jesus has done for me, for me to use some self-driven agenda to shame him when everyone can see what I'm doing, always do the right thing. 
And if you're doing what God wants you to be doing, he will put a desire in your heart and establish your thoughts and your desires will come to reality if they're in God's will. There is no hope for Satan and the fallen angels. However, there is hope for us. And that hope comes to us in the incarnation and the God-man Jesus Christ. In direct opposition to the spirit of pride, Jesus came to earth in humble circumstances. He came as a baby. He was God. He left heaven. He came to earth as a baby in a, to a single mother born in a barn. He couldn't have made it any more humble. He had humility of spirit that although being God, he took on the form of a servant and he sacrificed his very life in order to reconcile us to God. He gave up everything. So for people who think they have to give something up, you are going to be judged by the one who gave up everything, including heaven and his life for you. For those who believe in him, Jesus Christ has reversed the effects of mankind's fall and he has given us eternal life as an option. And as mediator between God and man, he has brought peace where there was separation, love where there was hatred, approval where there was shame, forgiveness where there was guilt, and life where there was death. And through the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ, we are counted as righteous before God because of Jesus. Through his humiliation and sacrifice, he atoned for our sin. Through his resurrection, we are granted eternal life and exalted to sit in heavenly places. Our pride resulted in our disgrace and death, but his humility and obedience results in our honor and exaltation if we will choose to humble ourselves. Salvation alone is not a guarantee against the temptation of pride. The Apostle Paul was given a mysterious thorn in his side to keep him from becoming proud. God had to teach Paul as he teaches us that we're both saved by God's grace and being sanctified by God's grace. We must be reliant and dependent on God for our strength if we are going to make any kind of progress at all in this Christian life. And as we grow in knowledge and good deeds, we'll be tempted to glory in ourselves. But this, again, is a trap from Satan. If you don't glory in yourself, you think you have been passed over, skipped, by God, that also is a trap from Satan. If you compare yourself to another person in ministry and you feel like you got less than, that is wicked pride. It is not by our own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us that we are able to imitate Christ's humility and thereby love and serve God, our neighbors, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and even our enemies. We should be doing everything in our everything choice by choice by choice to be a clean vessel for jesus because when we're not it impacts everyone around us and again we're being a missionary for jesus or satan and people who think they are following christ are being used by satan to destroy the body to cause people to be confused about jesus to think things about Christianity, that it isn't worth it, it doesn't work, Jesus isn't good, he's not enough. Don't allow yourself to be used by Satan, especially towards others. Do you want to stay stuck in self and risk missing out on eternity? Because that's what will happen. If you stay stuck serving self, good or bad, you're going to miss heaven. Jesus says that. I'm going to include, because I'm all about helping resolve anything I bring up, a PDF of a prayer, a very comprehensive prayer of repentance. I'm going to have it put in the notes so that you can work through this and break off five pages worth of things that will cause pride to prosper in your life. I will put that in the notes so that you can work through this with God for not everyone knows how to repent of pride, but here it is in detail. So I'm going to give that to you as a gift to help you get right with God. 
Pride is a gatekeeper for the devil. And you won't be allowed into heaven if you don't banish it from your life. I am begging everyone that ever hears this to repent and be saved because pride is the kingpin of the sins and definitely the one that allows the rest to stay. Precious Lord, you have been so amazing in my life and I have been on all sides of pride. I have been guilty of every single form of pride that is named in this and I marvel that you have Use great means at times to humble me, but I feel privileged that you took, that you cared enough to humble me and bring me to a place where I really have nothing except for you. I do know that. You are the most amazing one that I can, I can't even, I love belonging to you. I love, love, love belonging to you. Just being yours is like the greatest honor so i ask you god by the power of your holy spirit to bring conviction to everyone who is in agreement with the spirit of pride cause them to despise and hate pride in their lives because ridding themselves of that spirit will be the most incredible change for the kingdom and great things will happen if people will throw off pride and truly live for Jesus Christ. So I ask you to work a massive miracle in the lives of each person that they would repent and stop allowing themselves to live in their feelings and to demand on those feelings. Show them the cross and the price that was paid and what will happen if they don't lay it down. So I ask you for a miracle in each life, and I ask you, Jesus, to, I thank you for your blood that covers and washes me of all of my sin, that I have nothing except for you, and that's everything I want and need. So help me, Jesus, to walk faithful, and I ask that you help those who hear me to choose the same. You are worthy. You are the only one that is worthy. And I ask this in your precious name. Amen.